You know each of these individuals. We're about to start the webinar. Um, I'm going to let people in and I'll tell you when to begin, Michael. Oh, right. You're, the, you're here uh, in yeah. an official I capacity. I'm under both of the tables here. Yeah. Okay. okay, you do, and I'm going to start the. Ready, um, DHR. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Case Westerner Service University. Uh, this is the first event for 2022, and it's a big one. We have 425 people joining us on Zoom, and there are several in the room corporate. Uh, this event is a lecture titled Nazi Laws from Democracy to Dictatorship to Genocide. And it's a wonderful event for us because of our history as a law school with respect to Nuremberg and war crimes trials. Let me give you a little bit of that history. A lot of you may not know, but about 50 years ago, we had a faculty member named Sidney Jacoby who had been a Nuremberg prosecutor who taught on our faculty. He then brought in another Nuremberg prosecutor named Henry King, who was a member of our faculty for 30 years and the head of our Canada U.S. Law Institute. Henry then brought me to the law school in part because my uh, expertise and experience is also in war crimes. And I established our Henry King War Crimes Research Office which in 2005 was nominated by the chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone for the Nobel Peace Prize for the work that our students and faculty did to assist in the prosecution of Charles Taylor and other war criminals in that horrible conflict. Then when I became co-dean, I brought in Jim Johnson, who had been a prosecutor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone and is now the chief prosecutor of the residual special court for Sierra Leone. He runs our war crimes research office, and his students continue to do work on a number of projects for international tribunals around the world. He also started our Yemen accountability project, in which 70 of our students are currently working to document the atrocities in the conflict in Yemen for a future Nuremberg-type prosecution someday. So for us to be doing this particular lecture as the first one of 2022 is extraordinarily appropriate. And we are really happy to have joining that long list of professors with expertise in this area, uh, Kathy Mansman. Let me tell you a little bit about Kathy, who you see at the front there. 
Um, she's a member of the prestigious American Law Institute. She came to our law school a couple of years ago, um, having been a tenured law professor at Drake University Law School. She teaches many courses, including a very popular course on Nuremberg and the law. And she is so full of interesting uh, things that she does, including that she is the composer and producer of an opera about the Holocaust, which will be performed this spring at our Maltz Performing Arts Center here in Cleveland. So without further ado, let me turn things over to Kathy, and I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, so um, I just want to say how delighted I am to have joined the um, the group here at, at Case Western Reserve. And um, it's such a privilege to cover this material in the context of a university that focuses on these kinds of issues so deeply. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to get, we're waiting for the PowerPoint slide uh, deck to come up. Um, but I'm going to take us through um, the political and legal history, not very deeply because of, you know, you, it only, you can only cover so much in an hour, but basically through the, um, the history leading up to the Nazi regime. Um, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the court structure during the Nazi regime and also um, a key judicial opinion that, that came out um, interpreting the Nuremberg Laws. So with that, um, let's go. Eric, I'm advancing the slides, yes? Okay, I think we need to go off Zoom and onto the, it's not advancing, so. There we go. Okay, and um, these, as you can see, these slides are very dense with words um, because words matter when you're talking about legislation. And of course, they're so far away over there, I can't see them. So I'm going to turn around sometimes, for which I apologize. Um, so just a very, very brief, uh, longer history of Germany. Um, Germany had been made up of lots of different states. Um, from 1871 until 1918, it was ruled by um, three Kaisers. Um, and the one that we're going to focus on for a second is Kaiser Wilhelm II. That's him in the picture on the, on the right there. Um, and Kaiser Wilhelm abdicated right at the end of World War I, right before the, um, the armistice was signed. And he um, then exiled himself to the Netherlands. Um, still not advancing. Um, thank you. Um, and is there some way to get rid of the Zoom stuff? <laughs> uh, the technology of being both live and, uh, you know, on Zoom at the same time. So um, a little bit about World War I, because World War I really set the stage for um, the Nazi regime and for um, the, um, the um, Holocaust, ultimately. By the way, I should mention, it's International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is why we're doing this lecture um, today. Um, so uh, World War I, which, as you all probably know, ran from 1914 to 1918. Um, was carried out under Kaiser Wilhelm II. It was primarily fought in the rest of Europe off German soil. And so, um, you know, this is before the days of YouTube Live, of course. And so um, people really didn't really have a, a visceral understanding of what exactly was happening during World War I. Um, and so the German citizens tended to think that it was going better than it actually was. Um, and so when the war came to an end, to the German populace's mind quite suddenly, um, there was this sense of like, oh my gosh, what happened? How could we have ended up in this situation when the war was purportedly going so well for Germany? Um, and then that led to a kind of a dissolution of um, the social fabric of Germany in a way and to this stabbed in the back theory, which you sometimes hear about. The stabbed in the back theory is this idea that Germany would have won the war, except that it was stabbed in the back by domestic interests, as opposed to being defeated by international interests. And those domestic interests that supposedly stabbed Germany in the back were Jews and communists. Um, and so that, um, and Marxists, um, many of whom were Jews, um, and um, that kind of permeated the German psyche um, around around the end of the war. 
Um, there was also um, a, a really bad situation at home. So the German soldiers were coming back from the front from World War I to find their families you know, without food, um, without heat. Um, and so the situation in Germany was, was really quite bad. To top that off, um, there was this political di disintegration of the political system that had existed up until that point through the, through the Kaisers. Um, and so Kaiser Wilhelm abdicated. Um, there's a couple books that I highly recommend, one by Ben Hatt that really digs deep into this, um, into this period. But um, basically, um, the Social Democratic Apart Party, which was at the time the largest party, announced that they were going to create a new government, a constitutionally based government. And um, Frederick Ebert would be the first chancellor. Um, and this becomes a, an issue at the founding of the Nazi government because there were certainly the more conservative members of German society felt that this constitutional government known as the Weimar Republic, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, that it was kind of an illegitimate government because it, it, was, it was kind of created out of whole cloth at the end of World War I. So, um, so you get the, um, the Germans, you know, ending the war and then electing this National Assembly to, to draft this constitution. But at the same time, the populace starts really splitting into two camps, to the, the left, the Marxist communist side, and to the right, to the conservative nationalist uh, side. Um, and there's really not much in the middle. And um, you start getting these rebellions all over Germany, sometimes from the left, sometimes from the right, that are quite violent. There's a lot of, um, you know, there are, there are deaths, there are injuries. Um, and so you just get this really sort of social upheaval um, through, through this time. Um, one, of the, um, one of the rebellions, as it says up there, was in January 1919 in Berlin, the Spartacist left-wing rebellion. There was another left-wing attempt to take over Munich um, in April of 1919. That was put down um, by government troops and by mercenary soldiers called the Fry Corps. And I think we have a little video here about that. Oh, maybe not. Um, Okay, so then uh, the Weimar Constitution was then signed into law in August of 1919. And do, do I need to click the link or just go on to the next? Okay. So here's a short video about that. Oop. Can you? Um... Thanks. <laughs> February 1919. In Weimar, once home to Goethe and Schiller, the fall of the emperor paves the way for a freely elected National Assembly of the First German Republic. Democracy is completely new for many citizens. As we put our in on this, I can remember my relatives speaking of a woman, a teacher's widow, who had volunteered to put up three delegates. He had a buyer up go on with a freiwillig after them. And so after the one we and they were saying, how can this lady take such people into her home? So I should go. The delegates come to Weimar because there's unrest in Berlin. In 1918, the Great War had been lost, the Emperor had been overthrown, and now the communists are hustling for power. In January 19, there's an uprising.
The government is no longer responsible to the emperor, but to parliament. For the first time in German history, government authority emanates from the people. The constitution follows on from the failed revolution of 1848 and the ideals of the Paulskirche Assembly. Black, red, and gold, representing the German liberal tradition, are the chosen colors of the Weimar Republic. But the new state must bear the consequences of the war. The Treaty of Versailles allows victors to dictate their terms. Germany loses one-seventh of its territory and must pay reparations. Everyone called it the shameful Treaty of Versailles. Of course, without having read the many hundreds of paragraphs, there was great unanimity against the Versailles Treaty. Protests are also directed against the Republic. Supposedly, the Democrats and Socialists abandoned the victorious troops, the so-called stab in the back. The lie proves effective. Already in the first elections of the Reichstag in June 1920, the government parties of the Weimar Republic, the Social Democrats, Catholic Center Party, and the left liberals lose their majority. They would never regain this power. From the very beginning, also in Parliament, the young democracy faces determined opposition. I like to use these historical videos because there's really nothing that replaces seeing the actual thing. I could talk about it all day and it's, it's not as good. Um, so um, the Weimar Constitution gets signed into law and um, the only point of what I'm about to go through is to show that there was a um, separation of powers, that there was a check on powers, there was a balance of powers. Um, it differs from our Constitution in some ways, but um, I think it's important to see that it was a, a, an interrelated Constitution that had those basic notions that we think of. So there was a presidency, um, the president was to be elected by popular election for a term of seven, seven years, the president's eligible for re-election, recalled by popular vote, called by a two-third majority of the Reichstag. There's a separate position called the chancellor, appointed by the president. This is, of course, the position that Hitler takes uh, initially. Um, the chancellor pre presides over the government of the Reich and conducts its affairs. Um, the, the chancellor also determines the political program. There's also Reich ministers, which are kind of like cabinet ministers. They're recommended by the Reich chancellor, um, appointed and dismissed by the president. And again, the, the key point of all this is that there's actually like a structure to the government. Um, there's two houses of parliament, the Reichstag and the Reichsrat. The Reichstag is elected by universal, equal, direct, and secret suffrage, including women um, over 20 years of age. Um, seats are allotted to the parties based on the vote they get in the, um, in, in the election. Um, the term is four years. They can pass laws by a simple majority. Um, the Reichsrat, which is kind of the equivalent of our Senate, um, is elected by the parliaments of the 18 German states which you know is historically how our Senate had been elected. One represented for each state. Um, large states get one for every million voters. Um, legislation has a process it has to go through. So for those of you that are in my LLR class, you know, we're talking about that here. Um, basically, the Reich cabinet was supposed to introduce legislation with the concurrence of um, members of the Reichsrat or the Reichstag. It was enacted by the Reichstag. Once adopted, it could be protested by the equivalent of the Senate. The president could call for a referendum on things that were passed. So there's this very complicated process for passing laws and overriding the passage of the laws and going back and, and rethinking about it. Um, the Constitution also provided that it could only be amended if two-thirds of the members were present and two-thirds of those present consented to the amendment. This becomes important later because the way Hitler first starts to take over is he arrests some of the members of the parliament and then gets legislation passed. So we'll get to that in just a minute. And then there's this Article 48. We have nothing really like this. Um, Article 48, um, which ended up kind of, I, I guess, being the embedded time bomb for the Weimar Republic, 
um, says that in the event the public order and security are seriously disturbed or endangered, the Reich president may take the measures necessary for their restoration, intervening if necessary with the aid of the armed forces. For this purpose, he may temporarily, temporarily abrogate wholly or in part the fundamental principles laid down in the Articles of the Constitution, and those included liberty, house as a sanctuary, secrecy of individual communication, freedom of expression and no censor censorship, right to assembly, right of non-criminal association, and the right to private property. So this gives um, an enormous amount of power um, to the president to declare an emergency and start taking away what we consider to be civil liberties or civil rights. Um, and then there were some protections for this, which was that the president had to give notice to the Reichsrat, and then um, they could, if they wanted to, override or annul what the president had done. Um, interestingly, um, and then Article 25, the president could dissolve, dissolve the Reichstag, but only once for the same cause, and there had to be a new election within 60 days. So, you know, there's all these protections built around the structure of this government to keep it from returning to either a monarchy or a, a dictatorship. Um, it's important to note President Ebert, the first president, used Article 48 136 times. So that's pretty amazing. Um, they were sometimes for good reasons in real emergencies, and sometimes they were for political reasons. Um, so um, that is also important because that sets a precedent for using Article 48 that also becomes important later on. Um, this is stuff I think most people studied in, in high school um, about the currency inflation. You probably all may remember from your high school history textbook the picture of the wheelbarrow with uh, somebody going to buy a loaf of bread with a wheelbarrow of cash. Um, so, you know, the 20s, the early 20s were rough for Germany. Um, again, you had, you know, these uh, violent rebellions. The Cat Putsch was in March of 1920. That was a conservative nationalist attempt to overthrow the constitutional government. Um, and the army refused to defend the government, but um, basically Ebert was able to convince the general workers in Berlin to go on strike to put down the rebellion, and that worked. Um, uh, then, you know, you have this first election of the representatives of the Reichstag as all this stuff is going on. Um, in 1921, reparations for, um, that Germany had to pay for World War I were set, and um, they were very onerous. Germany was not able to meet those reparation um, uh, requirements. And um, as a result, France um, placed some soldiers in the Ruhr Valley, and things got very, very contentious uh, between France and Belgium versus Germany. Um, and then um, at the urging of the government, German, German workers went on strike to protest what they considered to be this invasion by Belgian and, and French um, folks, um, you know, simply because Germany didn't have the wherewithal to, to make its reparations payments. Um, Germany supported the striking workers by printing money, which was a bad idea. That resulted in really, really serious hyperinflation that completely devalued um, the value of the mark, which was the currency of the Weimar Republic. And you can see that in November of 23, um, a dollar was worth 4.2 trillion marks. Um, Ebert used Article 48 to deal with the economic situation, the economic crisis, 63 times. So um, again, you can see this heavy use of, of Article 38, Article 48, excuse me. Um, then in November of 23, you get the famous Beer Hall Putsch, and we're going to watch a little film about that. In Munich in 1923, in the atmosphere of crisis caused by the occupation of the Ruhr, Hitler and the Nazis acted. Hitler stood on the stage of the Bürgerbräuker on November the 8th and interrupted a right-wing political meeting. He called for a national revolution to start in Bavaria and overthrow the left-wing government in Berlin. The next day, the Nazis, together with other right-wing parties, marched through Munich to gain support. They were stopped by the police at the war memorial at the Feldhau Halle. The Nazis hoped the army and police, many of whom supported right-wing parties, would join them in a march on Berlin. 
Es ist was Schwieriges. Die kommen dann in die Maximilianstraße, die überkreuzen wir. Und dann an die Ecke der Residenz kommen wir, dann wird die Schüsse fahren. The police didn't support them. Shots were fired and the marchers were routed. Hitler fled from the scene. Four policemen and 16 Nazis lost their lives. Was ich da für Emotionen gehabt habe. Da möchte ich sagen, ja, da habe ich eigentlich die ersten politischen Emotionen gehabt, wie etwas äh, schief gehen kann. Es war schon natürlich ein Schlag für mich und für viele meiner Kameraden, dass das passieren wird. That is from a wonderful documentary called um, The Nazis, A Warning from History. That's got, it's a six CD set, so it's, it's, a, um, it's a really, really good in-depth documentary. Um, so um, Hitler then is tried for his participation in this rebellion. Um, he's given a pretty light sentence, and he's also, his sentence is reduced. And while he's in jail, he writes Mein Kampf, which is, um, you know, his sort of political, you know, plans for Germany, as well as um, quite evidently full of um, anti-Semitic uh, hatred. Um, but then in May, the Nazi party starts to actually make some showings in the elections. And then you can see that, you know, they, they keep increasing in their uh, representation in, in the um, legislature. Um, in the mid-1920s, things get a little bit better in Germany. Um, there's some changes to the reparations um, system that, that uh, gives a little bit of relief to Germany. So then in 25, President Paul uh, von Hindenburg is elected as president. Um, he remains president during the transition to the Nazi government, and I'll talk about him more later. Um, he was a traditional conservative. Um, he really felt like the democracy was an illegitimate, the Weimar democracy was an illegitimate government. Um, and he used Article 48 a lot of times. Sometimes he would dissolve the government and call for new elections. Um, and then um, you can see in 28, the Nazi party got 12 seats. Um, but then in 1929, the economy worldwide tanked again, um, including in the United States. So it was the beginning of the Great Depression. A bunch of banks in Germany failed. I think five, yeah, five banks uh, collapsed. Um, there's another presidential election in 32, and Hitler runs to be president, but he's beat by Hindenburg. Um, and then in July of 1932, for the first time, the Nazis become the majority political party. And I think what's important about all this is that it's all through elections, right? So, but of course, you have not just two parties like we do. You have many, many parties, so you can. You can win without getting more than 50% of, of the vote. Um, January 30th, 1933, Hindenburg, Hindenburg appointed Hitler as chancellor. So now Hitler's in one of the top two executive positions. Um, and here's another short film about that. So that was the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, and that was a torchlight parade in celebration of Hitler being appointed chancellor. And in another lecture I give, um, where I, um, I, I actually show some photos of a, a lot of the department stores in Berlin were owned by Jewish families, and a lot of the windows were broken on those stores that night and stuff like that. Um, okay, so Hitler becomes chancellor, and right away he asked Hindenburg to dissolve the government and hold another election. 
um, which Hindenburg agrees to do. Hindenburg's quite old by this time. He's in his early 80s. Um, and on February 4th, there's this presidential decree issued. Um, it's called the Decree for the Protection of the German People, and it um, bans political meetings, marches, restricts the press, gives police expanded powers of arrest, and all of that is in anticipation of the March 5th election. Um, one of the things that I think is worth noting about this presidential decree is the title, right? Um, words matter, and this isn't you know, described as you know, a decree in anticipation of the upcoming election or something, it's for the protection of the German people. So this is the beginning of this series of legislation that is titled and, and sort of resounds with these words that um, make it seem like the, the real Germans are under attack from those who would harm them and that all these measures are necessary to preserve the life and well-being of real Germans. So that's the first thing that happens. Now, this is February of 1933. The election was scheduled for March 5th. But before the election could take place, on February 27th, 1933, the Reichstag, which is where the legislature met, um, burned to the ground. Um, so I think the next thing I have is some video of the damage. And then we'll talk about what happened with that. Today we see the Reichstag, the German party parliament in Berlin which has been seriously destroyed by fire. The main war in which the leftists conducted their debate has suffered most from the conflagration. And after the general election, which is about to take place, Parliament will have to find a temporary home elsewhere. Came for no respect of the person, and Vincent Hindenburg's own child was also destroyed. Hitler, now Chancellor, has announced that the power was the work of communists and was intended to be the signal for a Bolshevist uprising across the country. In consequence, Germany has been placed under a system of martial law, a decree having been signed which aided the total destruction of communism. So um, the Reichstag fire was, um, was uh, purportedly set by communists. Um, including uh, a man main, named uh, van der Lubbe, and in a minute we're going to see part of his trial. Um, but um, regardless of who said it, it served as the pretext for the first major decree that was really the step onto the slide into the Nazi regime. And that was, uh, it's called the Reichstag Fire Decree. You'll notice it was issued under Article 48, Paragraph 2, so it was the declaration of emergency by... President von Hindenburg. Um, it took away the right to assembly, free speech, free press. It removed restraints on police investigations. It allowed the Gestapo to take people into something called protective custody. So that was like if they were thought it was thought that they were going to commit a crime, they could be arrested and placed in protective custody. And similarly, the criminal police, the local <coughs> police, got the right to hold people in something called preventive detention, which was similar. It was like you know, we think you're gonna commit a crime or a violent act, and so we're gonna take you into custody. Um, it gave the central government authority to overrule state and local laws and made punishment more severe, including death replacing a life sentence. And it was, if you read the text, which I actually have my students do in the Holocaust and the Law class, it's framed as a defensive measure against communist acts of violence. So again, you get this, this constant like beat of this drum that like we're under attack and we need to defend ourselves. Um, the election goes forward on March 5th, just a few days later. Um, but of course, by now, the police have gone out and raided communists and, elect, and you know, arrested people um, using the preventive detention rules. Um, and so you know, those people obviously can't vote. Um, but in the March 5th election, the Nazis got 44% of the vote, and then between them and the right-wing nationalists, they were able to get a majority. This is a picture of Hitler listening to the election results um, at his radio. Okay, so, so again, February 28th is the, is the Reichstag fire, March 5th is the election, and then on March 24th, Hitler um, got uh, um, the president to issue 
this um, this uh, enabling act, um, and um, it's called the law to remedy the distress of the people in the Reich. Um, again, same kind of language. Um, it basically takes the Reichstag's legislative power and it transfers it to Hitler. So, you know, mind you, there's other parts of government, right? There's the president, there's the Reichsrat, um, there's the power that the states had. Those aren't affected yet, um, but it does take the Reichstag's power, the main legislative body, and, and turns it over to, to Hitler, to the chancellor. Um, it says laws and constitutions can be changed without permission by the Reichstag or the president, so it marginalizes them. They can deviate for the constitution. All laws are effective the day after they're passed. Um, and it passed the Reichstag, um, and I'm sorry, I said before that it was issued by the president. That was a misstatement. It was passed by the Reichstag um, by a vote, um, and it was after they detained all 81 of the communist members of the Reichstag and 26 of the 120 social democrats. Um, so if you do the math, basically they were still following the constitutional rules on two-thirds majority of two-thirds of the legislature. Um, and again, I think this is really important because throughout the entire Nazi regime, um, you get the Nazi governments doing these things like by the book, if you will. Um, now, is arresting you know a, a majority of your opponents by the book? No, but technically, this legislation passed following the constitutional um, the constitutional limits. Um, the next thing that happened was the law for imposition of the death penalty. This is called the Lex van der Lubbe law. He was the guy who was um, convicted of setting the Reichstag fire. And um, again, it, it diverges from the constitutional protections that the Weimar Constitution had provided um, because it applies the death penalty retroactively to him. Um, and um, it was applied by the German Supreme Court retroactively to him. Um, what's interesting is they did not apply it to other Reichstag fire defendants retroactively. This kind of pissed Hitler off, and um, Hitler later, as a result of his distrust of what the regular German courts would do, um, created something called the People's Court, which was a court to try political cases, and I'll talk about them in a little bit. Um, by the way, this is just kind of an interesting late, late, late note, but he was exonerated in 2008. Van der Lubbe was exonerated by the German government in 2008. Okay, this is his trial, a bit, just a bit of his trial. Inside the German Supreme Court, I said about trial for a crime that helps me out of cigarettes in part in part. The first being let in and manacled after eight days before the court is Baroness Van der Lubbe, 24-year-old politician. interesting so it was a bronze copula to the um, to the Reichstag building and um, when Germany unified they put a glass dome over the building to signify transparency in government and it's a really interesting place to visit if you ever go to Berlin okay so um, you know we're only two months into Hitler being Chancellor at this point not even and um, one of the very first things that he does is start issuing uh, decrees that relate to restricting Jews so um, one of the very first ones was a boycott of Jewish businesses. It happened on April 1st, 1933. There are tons of pictures of this event. It's, it's really interesting as a researcher in this area, there's lots and lots of pictures in the early days. And then um, after the war starts in September of 39, 
there's a lot less pictures, and by the time the deportation of Jews starts in 1941, there's almost no pictures. Um, there's some pictures of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there's a couple pictures of deportations in towns in Germany, but um, a lot of the international photographers were had already left um, left town. But this is, of all, my, all the pictures I have of this event, I think the creepiest one. This is actually a photographer that was stationed by the government in front of a Jew Jewish business so that anyone who went in to defy the boycott had their picture taken. And so it's, you know, this sort of, you know, we know that you're a Jew lover kind of thing. Um, and then um, this is a film of the boycott as well. Sorry about the music. So um, people always ask me why that sign is in English and German, and I do not know the answer other than they just wanted to make sure that you know the United States and England knew that this was going on. I, I really don't know, but I think it's very interesting that the sign is in German as well as English. Um, okay, um, so also in April, a few days later, you get something called the Law for the Restoration of the Professional Civil Service. Again, the title is really interesting because it's like the restoration to German values. We're gonna get rid of people who we don't want in our government. So civil servants are unfit if they've served in the Communist Party or they've aided the Communist Party. And then civil servants of non-Aryan descent are also supposed to be retired. Um, you're non-Aryan if you descend from non-Aryans, very specific, especially Jewish parents or grandparents. Um, so as a result of this, um, a lot of, um, and there's a separate section for former political activity against the government, um, a lot, a lot of civil servants were fired at this point. So, um, you know, this is a, a letter of a woman who is being dismissed from her position as the principal of a public high school because she's Jewish. Um, okay, so there was also a law concerning admission to the bar. I thought, that, I mean, there's tons of these laws, so I just had to pick a few, and I thought this would, for, obviously for a law audience, this is an interesting one. So um, the admission to the bar of attorneys who are non-Aryan can be revoked. Um, but it's really interesting to note, and a lot of these early statutes have this exception. If you served in World War I, or you were um, in Germany during World War I, you were sometimes excluded from coverage of the law. Um, there's, um, you can see at the bottom here, Saul Friedlander, who wrote a, a terrific book um, called Nazi Germany and the Jews. Um, he, his statistics show that of the 4,585 Jewish lawyers practicing in Germany, 3,167 were allowed to continue, um, and a lot of um, judges and prosecutors were also allowed to continue in their job because they had um, they met the exception of um, of uh, being uh, already admitted to the bar on August 1, 1914, so before World War One started. Um, these are just some pictures of um, there was a, a procedure for petitioning for readmission to the bar. Um, if you had been kicked out, and these are Jewish lawyers lining up to, to petition 
to be readmitted. That's also um, Berlin. Um, all these anti-Jewish measures um, caused people in the United States to um, get up in arms. You know, there's a large Jewish presence in the United States, particularly you know in cities like New York and Cleveland and Chicago. So this is actually um, a, a organization of at public hall um, in in you know to protest what was going on in Germany um, and public auditorium still downtown. So that's the same room that's that's down there. And then I've given this um, I've given this talk in Chicago too. So the next one is actually a parade in Chicago. I'll just show you two seconds of that. People who actually live in Chicago are more interested in this. It moves very slowly. <laughs> Um, okay, so the last thing left to do to give Hitler complete power is to eliminate um, the states, eliminate the Reichsrat, and eliminate the president. Because right now Hitler's chancellor and he has the legislative authority of the Reichstag. Um, so that all happens in early 1934. They dissolve all the state parliaments in January. In February, um, they uh, dissolve the Reichsrat. Only thing that's left now is Hindenburg in the presidency. He's really old, he's on his deathbed, and the next thing, well, not quite on his deathbed, but he dies um, soon thereafter. So he remains president. Um, I think Hitler was probably, Hitler had this gift, I guess you could say, of knowing just how far he could push before there would be pushback. And I think that there was this sense that messing with Hindenburg, who was, you know, had been around for a long time, he was a nationalist, he had a lot of support from, from people on the right, that that would be too much. Um, and so he waited until the night before Hindenburg died. And the night before Hindenburg died, um, they, uh, he promulgated the law regarding the sovereign head of the German Reich. It consolidated the office of president with the chancellor, it transferred the authority of president to the Fuhrer and Reich Chancellor Adolf Hitler, and it was effective on Hindenburg's death. And so when he died the next day, Hitler now had all the political power in Germany, all of it. Um, which, if you think about it, is quite a constitutional feat, right? I mean, you have this, you saw what the Constitution looked like. It had all these checks and balances, and, you know, it's, it's just gone. Um, interestingly, Hitler continued to have uh, elections um, that were just sort of plebiscites, like endorsements of what he had done. Um, but of course, you know, by now a lot of people are being arrested. The communists are arrested. You know, you can't vote if you're Jewish. Um, so it 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 doesn't mean much. Um, so again, August 1st, 1934 is when Hindenburg dies, and then one of the first things that Hitler does, and this shows you how important attorneys and judges are to a political system, is um, he does something called the coordination of the bench and the bar. Um, so in 1919, the oath that lawyers took was, I swear loyalty to the Constitution, obedience to the law, and conscientious fulfillment of the duties of my office, so help me God. Right after Hindenburg dies, they change that oath to, I swear I will be true and obedient to the Fuhrer of the German Reich and people, Adolf Hitler, observe the law and conscientiously fulfill the duties of my office, so help me God. Um, and then also German judges took an oath to Hitler rather than to the Constitution. Um, then all professional associations at all affiliated with the law were merged into a single organization, the National Socialist League of German Jurists. This, was, this happened in other professions as well where there was like a, a, a unification of everybody in the profession. Okay, so then that was all 1934, 1935, you get the Nuremberg Laws, which most people have heard of already. The Nuremberg Laws are called that because they were adopted in Nuremberg. Um, there were actually two of them. Um, one was defining who was a citizen of the Reich, and the second prohibited marriages and extramarital sexual relations between Jews and German nationals. First one is called the Reich Citizenship Law. The second one, consistent with the titles we've been seeing, is called the Law for the Protection of German Blood and Honor. 
Um, and again, they're called the Nuremberg Laws. We're just going to watch a teeny tiny part of this next film. This is the actual announcement of the Nuremberg Laws at the, the Nazi Party conference in Nuremberg where they were um, issued. So we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, um, so um, the Reich citizenship law, um, it's it, the part that's I think the most important is Article 2. Um, it's only a subject who is of German or kindred blood and who through his conduct shows he's both willing and able to faithfully serve the German people and the Reich, and only those people have full political rights. And then in Article 3, um, it gives the Reich Minister of the Interior, along with Führer, the Führer, to do implementing regulations, what we would call implementing regulations in the United States. So, um, and then the Law for Protection of German Blood and Honor basically um, forbid um, marriages between Jews and Germans and forbid sexual intercourse except in marriage between Jews and Germans. Um, now, this becomes important because in a minute I'm going to talk about the Supreme Court case that interpreted this, this statute. Um, it also, by the way, it prohibited Jews from employing female Germans below age 45, so that just like perpetuates this notion that, you know, Jewish men are, are you know, going to lust after and, and defile young German women. Um, you can't you can't display the Reich flag, but you can display the Jewish flag. Um, so you know all these kind of restrictions that separate who is a German and who's not a German. Um, the first regulation is issued, and it's the first time they define who a Jew is. Um, I talk about this a lot in my Holocaust in the Law class, um, but um, it's anyone who descends from at least three grandparents who are fully Jewish. Um, also, anyone who um, descends from two fully Jewish grandparents, if they're observant, basically, if they belong to the religious community. Um, we talk about this more extensively in my class, but we, we talk about this notion of Judaism as a, a like a blood thing, as a, you know, it's, that it's like something that's in your blood. But then if that's true, why would you change the definition based on who belongs to the community, chooses to belong to the community? Um, but anyway, that's our first definition of who a Jew is. And then we get Article 11 that says extramarital relations in the sense of paragraph two of the law only refers to sexual relations. Um, okay, again, that becomes important in the Supreme Court case. There's tons of other restrictions on Jews. You can go to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's website and they have a date list of all the restrictions. These are just some examples. Um, that picture on the top left, that's actually a post-war picture, but I, I have it, I use it in my lectures because of the bench that says Nicht für Juden, which means not for Jews. Certain benches were for Jews, certain were not. Um, the Jewish stars, of course, most people know about that. That actually didn't come into play until 1941 or 42, depending on where you were. You had to have a J stamped on your, um, on your passport if you were Jewish. Um, you'll see it's Clara Sarah. Uh, all Jews, Jewish women had to add the name Sarah to their names as their middle name. Um, all Jewish men had to add the name Israel to, as their middle name. Um, there were certain streets Jews couldn't walk on. Um, at some point, they had to turn their pets over to the government. They had to turn over all their jewelry. First, they had to inventory their jewelry and turn in the inventory. And then a few months later, they seized all the jewelry. Um, so, you know, there's just this increasing constant drumbeat of anti-Jewish um, legislation. Okay, before the Nazi regime, doesn't that look like our court system? It does. The court system in Germany before the Nazi regime looked like ours. Local courts, district courts, courts of appeals, and a Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court in 1936 was asked to interpret the Nuremberg Laws. Um, so the judge who did that, who became a defendant in the Nuremberg trials, um, was, um, I'm sorry, no, he committed suicide. I got him mixed up with uh, another guy. Uh, so he began serving as a judge in 1907. Um, he became the chief justice um, in 1929. 
and then he committed suicide in April of 1945. Okay, so we have all these statutes that say basically the Jews and Germans can't marry, they can't have sex. Um, we have a definition of who a Jew is. We have a, the first regulation that defines extramarital relations to mean sexual relations. And so what the court was um, called on, what the Supreme Court of Germany was to decide what sexual relations mean. Um, and what is shocking to me about this case and to my students who I have read this case is how it reads just like one of our cases. It's, there's never anything where they step back and say anything about what's going on here, right? That you're, you're basically sorting the German populace into the real Germans and the fake Germans or the Jews. Um, and instead, they just interpret the narrow legal question at hand. Um, the question of law which is to be decided by the great Senate upon the appeal of the state's attorney for the first criminal Senate in two pending cases is posed as follows. Whether the term sexual relations in the context of Article 11 of the first ordinance, blah, 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 is to be understood as referring only to intercourse, acts similar to intercourse, or illicit sexual acts. That's the question they have to decide. And in the holding, they say the term sexual relations in the context of the Nuremberg Law does not include every kind of illicit sexual action, but is also not restricted to sexual intercourse alone. It includes the entire range of natural and unnatural sexual relations that in addition to sexual intercourse includes all other sexual activities with a member of the opposite sex that according to the nature of the activities are intended to serve as a substitute for sexual intercourse and satisf satisfying the sexual needs of a partner. Why did they hold this? What's their reasoning for the opinion? Again, it looks like something you'd see in any legislative interpretation. You look at the words chosen by the drafters, which in German, German's a very specific language, and so they look at, at that. Look at the words in question in the context of the whole law. What's the intent of the law? Is this starting to sound like our class, right? Starting to sound like LLR in here, right? But it's you look at the intent of the legislation. Um, what is the intent or purpose of the law? It's the protection of German blood, but also the protection of German honor, which is why sexual intercourse is not the only thing covered, right? If, sexual, if blood was the only thing covered, we'd be concerned about body fluids being exchanged. But we are concerned also about German honor. Um, okay, so the, the regular German courts stayed... Um, part of the court system all through the Nazi regime. But in addition to that, um, the, um, the, uh, Hitler created these special courts, um, again, in part because he was dissatisfied with the refusal of the Supreme Court to retroactively punish the, um, the defendants from the Reichstag fire with, uh, with death. So um, I'm going to talk about each, each um, one of these. Um, so, uh, and this is a quote from the Nuremberg Trials, the most crucial and radical change in the judicial system under the Third Reich was the establishment of various extraordinary courts. These irregular tribunals permeated the entire judicial structure and eventually took over all judicial business which touched political issues or were related to the war. So the first one was the special courts. They were the first ones created, created in March 21, 1933. Um, they were specifically there to adjudicate the offenses listed in the Reichstag decree. They had 34 of them. It was to combat anti-Nazi activity. There was one president and two associate judges, no appeal at all. Um, the um, chief judge um, here was, uh, or one of the judges was Oswald Rotog. He was admitted in 26. Um, he was serving in Nuremberg. Um, and he was actually the presiding judge in the in the Katz defiling case, which I'll talk about in Katzenberger case, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then in the Katzenberger opinion, which was again this case where he sentenced a Jewish man for uh, for having sex with uh, sorry uh, yeah Jewish man for having sex with a non Jewish woman. Um, when there was actually no evidence. He said, the political form of life of the German people under national socialism is based on the community, 
One fundamental factor of the life of the national community is the racial problem. If a Jew commits racial pollution with a German woman, this amounts to polluting the German race and by polluting a German woman to a grave attack on the purity of German blood, the need for protection is particularly strong. So you get the tenor of the, of the special courts. Um, the Katzenberger case, um, again, the facts of this case um, were that I, Irene um, Seiler, who you see there testifying in the Nuremberg trials after the war, um, had her father had been friends with Katzenberger. Um, so he was like 30 or 35 years her senior. Um, she and he both testified that they did not have a sexual relationship at all, but they were very fond of each other. She, I guess he had known her since she was a little girl. And um, the charge was that they had violated two statutes. One was the race defilement law and the other was a law that increased sentences if you took advantage of war conditions. And so the what they said was that basically um, because they had gone to see each other when there were blackouts during bombings, that was taking advantage of wartime uh, conditions. Um, they, they, both, um, they both testified that there was no sexual relationship of any kind between them. And then here's the charges against them that they violated, like I said, the law for the protection of German blood and honor, and then they also violated the folk pest law um, with the special circumstances. They were also charged with perjury. Katzenberger was sentenced to death. Um, Seiler was sentenced to two years hard labor and loss of her civil rights. Um, again, this is the special courts, but you, they go through this whole thing about whether Katzenberger is Jewish or not. It reads just like any finding of fact, you know, here's what his parents were, here's his grandma, here's, you know, the whole family line. Um, then they go through her family line, you know, here's why she's German blood. Um, and then um, they, the evidence is they visited each other frequently. She accepted gifts of money. She sat on his lap and they kissed. Um, and then they go on to conjecture about what else could have been going on. Um, they took advantage of wartime conditions um, and um, that Siler is guilty of perjury because she den denies any of this. Um, the court found, finds that it's sexual in nature and, you know, without going, I, I don't want to, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to shorthand this, but basically they sentenced him to death and, and her to, um, to prison time. Um, the, there was actually, um, uh, Der Sturmer was the Nazi newspaper, which was vehemently anti-Semitic. And um, what they said about it was the world Jewry will discover that Germany knows how to defend herself with the severe measures against Jewish race defilers. Now it will again write using the old long tried tactics about the medieval conditions prevailing in Germany. It will again glorify those poor, deplorable, harmless Jews who become the victims of national socialist legislation. It will give vent to spite and malice towards Germany. So again, it's like shifting who's the victim and who's the perpetrator, right? You see that in, in all this stuff. Um, the People's Court was created to try treason cases. You may have actually heard of the People's Court and not know it because it tried some of the f famous cases. So there was an attempt on Hitler's uh, life um, in 1944. That case was tried in the People's Court. Um, the White Rose uh, case was tried in the People's Court. Um, again, if you take my class, we actually watch a film about that About that. Um, that trial. Um, the chief judge of the People's Court was a guy named Roland Freisler. Um, he's known as Raving Roland, um, and you'll see why in a second. Um, he had been a, a lawyer since 1922. He was killed when a bomb fell on the People's Court in, in 1945. This is um, footage of him during the trial of the conspirators to assassinate Hitler. Oh, no, it's not. The next page is about the White Rose case. So this is actually um, the, the White Rose group. Um, here we go.
Okay, and then the last court, and then I'll start taking questions, was the hereditary health court. Um, I could do a whole lecture on the hereditary health court. You, you may have heard, and it's true, that the first victims of the Nazi regime um, were um, people with physical and mental defects. Um, actually, the scientific backing for this came from the United States originally. Um, but, of course, it was based on this notion that to have a, a citizenry that's pure blood, you have to eliminate any defects in the genetic material that's you know, circulating in the, in the population. Um, so this was, the purpose here was to force sterilization of anyone with a hereditary disease. And hereditary diseases included things like, you know, deafness that, that came on in adulthood, that, you know, um, it, it was a pretty expansive list. Um, and also, um, you know, a tendency towards criminality that could be handled under that statute. So it was really given an expansive, um, an expansive definition. Okay, so um, that's what I got. I'm happy to take whatever questions anyone in the room has, and I'll also take a look at um, um, at the questions. Yeah. Uh, so if the if if the oh sorry if the Jewish businesses were were um, boycotted starting in 1933. So that, the, did that really stick, or what yeah. happened that it's a good allowed question. Jews to continue to live in Germany into the 40s? Yeah, so actually it didn't stick. Um, it was um, kind of, it was never like officially rescinded, but it was more like a, a day-long kind of focus. Um, you know, there was pushback from the United States, um, and so Jewish businesses for a few years were able to keep operating. The next thing that happened, though, was that Jewish businesses were Aryanized, which was the forced sale of Jewish businesses at deeply discounted prices. Um, for, uh, for businesses that um, had a, a, like a Jewish owner with non-Jewish employees who had good relations, you sometimes had the sale from the Jewish owner to the non-Jewish employee, and then the Jew would continue to work there until they were prohibited by statute from working for that particular business. So one of the things I didn't talk about um, is that um, after the Reich citizenship law, you had um, profession-specific orders, um, which were that like you know Jewish doctors either can't practice or they can only practice on Jewish patients. Um, you know, uh, Jewish instrumentalists can't serve in the Berlin Philharmonic. I mean, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, so ultimately, Jews were pushed out of business, but the boycott did not did not stick for a long time. So um, you said that a lot of judges who were Jewish like could like retain their position. I was wondering if you know like how it impacted like their like their work and their like influence, I guess, like in the court? Yeah, so they were eventually kicked off the bench. So they were not all kicked out in April of 1933, and I don't remember the date, but at a, at a time later, they were um, taken off the bench and taken out of the bar. So ultimately, they, they were not, you know, doing this kind of thing. I just, I have to tell you, one of the questions is from a friend of mine from high school, from Cleveland Heights High School, who just says, hi, Kathy. <laughs> hi, Ruth. <laughs> um, I have, it's a twofold question. Um, so in terms of the Holocaust, there were other groups of people that were obviously persecuted. I'm assuming that the, like, gay slash lesbian community probably fell under the hereditary courts in terms yep. of... But in, what about like Romani people and other groups of yeah. races that were considered like non-German? Yeah, so first of all, I think that it's important to note that a lot of victims of the Nazi government didn't go to court at all, like especially outside of Germany. So, um, you know, in Germany, there was more of this sense of preserving the structure of government. Um, when you got to, you know, Poland, where the Eisensgruppen just went and shot people, there was none of that. Um, so, um, so it's really important to distinguish those two. Also, with preventive custody and the rights to arrest people without charge, if they were about to commit something, 
or, or supposedly about to commit something, it was, it was quite easy to arrest people for no reason at all. Um, there were certainly, Berlin was known as a very gay town in the 20s, and so um, there was a lot of persecution against, um, against the um, homosexual community in Germany. Um, I don't know if they were ever taken to the hereditary health court laws, because the point of that was to stop procreation of people with hereditary health issues, and of course, I don't think they were too concerned about gay people procreating, so, um, but yeah, there was certainly persecution of other kinds, so the courts were not the only instrumentality of persecution. Interestingly, in, um, in Germany, before you were deported as a Jew, you actually got like a legal notice that you were going to be deported, and you were told where to report and when, and yada, yada, yada. You know, again, by the time you get to other um, other countries, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, that that's not the case. Thank you. Um, and then, can you expand on your opera a little bit? Sure. Little bit? Um, that was how I got interested in all of this. Um, I um, started doing research for what became the Sparks Fly Upward, which is this opera that I wrote. Um, even though it's about the Holocaust, it's not depressing. It's really about um, you know, our obligations as humans when stuff like this happens in the world. And we now know that you know, even though Nazi Germany was horrific, it wasn't the only one. We've had you know, all kinds of genocides since then. Um, and of course, you know, there is, um, you know, a current threat to democracy in many, many places in the world. So, um, so anyway, um, so yeah, so the opera is hopeful because it's about being aware and being engaged and the individual choices that we make. Um, and it hasn't been performed in like 10 years and it's being performed here in June. So I hope you'll all be there. Um, yeah, and auditions are this weekend if you happen to sing and you want to come audition. So, um, and again, it's called the Sparks Fly Upward. It'll be at the Maltz Performing Arts Center. I'm sure the law school will do some, you know, stuff about how to get tickets and stuff like that. So, yeah. So as far as I'm aware, in the United States, there were these one-drop laws regarding racial purity in the South and in many other parts of the country, uh, meant to sort of discriminate against the African American community in this country, saying if you were, if you had one drop of black blood, you were you were black, and mm -hmm. that was meant to disenfranchise people. There is a there is this idea that a lot of Nazi racial purity laws came as a result of, you know, the studying of these laws conducted here in this country. Is this true? Is there a correlation between the, these Nazi racial purity laws and what what occurred in this country? Yes, I think there is. Um, and even I, I, it's not in this presentation, but there's even there was even like a chart um, to show who was a Jew and who wasn't that looks very much like the chart that you may have seen in high school over who's black and who isn't. Um, and, and, you know, eugenics started in the United States and became the basis of the hereditary health courts and the sterilization effort. Um, there's a really great American experience uh, segment on eugenics and the role that the United States played in setting that foundation for what happened in Nazi Germany. So yeah, it definitely um, came, uh, we, we were definitely part of the backing for, for the whole notion that you could determine someone's race by their blood and you know also that there were good races and bad races um and you may you may know this but you know there were the one drop statutes in the united states but there were also these categorizations of people as like octoroons and you know based on if you were one eighth black and it it affected what you could do whether you could vote whether you were covered by certain laws so so yeah we certainly played a role in setting setting the ground for that yeah. There's so much you could talk about. Yes, there is. <laughs> um, but both what's going on now and what's been going on for the last 20, 30 years, um, going back to what he was just talking about, so was the argument back then, don't question the science of eugenics? Um, do you mean like the argument now? 
know, the argument then, don't question the science of eugenics, was used by the Nazis to justify what they were doing. Um, yeah. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but I think at the I, time it was just... I'm just saying, just... like, now there's all this, don't question the science, accept the science. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, like, and we're being... Has, has government changed, really, in the last hundred years? Are they still doing the same thing of whatever would justify the way they want to go, they're going to use... If it doesn't, then just ignore that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I, I haven't seen anyone point to the eugenics science as a reason for questioning science now. I just, I really don't no, have an answer for that. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying now. I'm just saying at that time, there's a lot of people who accepted eugenics as a, as a legitimate yeah, science. Yeah, that's true. And so that, that, that was the science of the day then. Um, mm -hmm. And so now people are saying, hey, you can't question the science, what are the sciences today? Um, and it's being used to, you know, whereas to me, true science is always questioning, always asking to what, you know, what are the results of this? Let's explore further. What's, let's it keep examining and always keep looking because, you know, Pluto was a planet when I was a kid. That was the science. Now he's not, now Pluto's not a planet. Um, and that's a minor thing, but, you know, science is always changing. But, um, I, I'm just looking, uh, I'll be real specific, uh, the, um, the terrorist laws that they've passed, which, and again, the names that you have, it's, you know, whatever it is, the Patriot Act or whatever, uh, the last time they passed that, they put laws in there that basically they can hold U.S. citizens without trial and without charges indefinitely. And uh, I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. And I'm not sure if that's what's going on with all the people from the who. Well, uh, let me just sort of say, I think that um, I, there, I'd be hard pressed to find a current situation where science was justified as a basis, as a pretext for genocide, um, which, you know, that was clearly what was happening then. So, um, you know, I don't know, I don't, you know, even the Muslim ban Trump's Muslim ban was not actually a Muslim ban. It might have been a proxy for a Muslim ban, but it wasn't based on some science that Muslims are inferior to the rest of humans or something. So I, I don't know that there's a, a, a straight correlation there. Though that is how genocide happens, is you divide people based on you're better, you're worse, and then you get people into a frenzy. I mean, I, I, I give that lecture to high schools, right? That, that like tolerance and diversity are the first steps to genocide. Now, you know, one's way over here and the other one's way over there. But definitely dividing into groups can serve as the, as the first step to genocide. And you see that in Rwanda, you see it in, you see it in every country where there's been a, a genocide. Um, um, what role beyond lending extra legitimacy do you think that the preservation of formulism in the law and, and the preservation of what being very like keeping with the legal formalities might have played beyond lending yeah. legitimacy? Yeah. Um, also, something we talk about in my class. Um, so um, there's a really great art, law review article that I assigned by David Lubin. Um, in the class that talks about the fact that for a lot of lawyers, like the Nuremberg Laws came out and they were like, oh, let's get to work. And we sat down and we did what lawyers do, right? Who's a Jew, who isn't? Oh, you're a Jew, you're not. And, and so there wasn't like that step back to think about whether the law itself was moral or immoral. Now, it's easy for us to look back and say that was clearly an immoral law and lawyers and judges should not have enforced it. But think about the times in our own country where people have refused to follow laws because they thought they were immoral. And that also poses a problem. So it's a really tricky, um, complex analysis, right? So the example I always use is um, the person in, I think it was Alabama, who was working for the wherever you got your marriage license and would not issue a marriage license to any gay couples. Um, so, you know, that person was looking at the requirements of a statute and of a constitutional decision and saying that that offends my moral sense and, and so I'm not going to follow it. Now, why is that person wrong and someone who won't follow the Nuremberg laws right? Do you know what I mean? So 
I, I'm not taking a position on either of those. I'm just saying that I think these things in real time are much more complex because we also don't want people just flouting the letter of the law, um, but we also want people to have a moral compass and a moral center. And where those two meet is very fraught. Are there any virtual questions? Yeah, um, let me just quickly look. Um, Sorry, it's hard to read while I'm doing this. Um, the question is, of all the jurists who survived the war, how many were subsequently treated as war criminals? How many continue to practice law in post-war Germany? That's a really interesting question. So, you know, the Nuremberg trials themselves um, really only went after very few people. Um, so you had the um, major war crimes trials, which I had 23, 24 defendants, I can't remember. Um, and then you had another, I think there were nine more trials that were industry specific. So you had a medical case, you had an Eisensgruppen case, you had a, um, a case about the camps, um, you had a case about industry. Um, that left a lot of jurists and lawyers not tried in the Nuremberg trials, but there were many, many domestic trials in Germany in the various sectors of Germany. So, you know, there was the American sector and the French sector. Um, you know, there were, tr there were trials in, you know, a, a lot of the countries that tried people who had participated. Um, then you also had jurists and lawyers who went through a process called denazification, which was a way that they could get their credentials back and, um, and continue practicing. So the answer is not one single answer. A lot of different things happen. Um, can you adjust the screen so we can see the presenter? Too late. Um, <laughs> Um, what helped Hitler to arrest his political opponents before the parliament elects their leader? Um, what was the reaction from the German public? I don't know the answer about the German public, um, but it was the just previous passing of the preventive detention law that, and protective custody that allowed Hitler to take those people into custody. Um, when did the ghetto structure start? I actually don't know the answer to that. My guess is late 40, early 41, but I'm not positive. Um, another alumni from Cleveland Heights High School saying hi. Hi, Ken Myers. This is great. This is one of the best things about Zoom, right? Um, Resistance, quiet or otherwise, within the bureaucracy that may have either falsified documents or otherwise poured sand on the gears? It's a really good question. Um, and I, I don't know that there was small resistance like that in the government. There were certainly you know, efforts like Stauffenberg and others to actually um, assassinate Hitler or terminate the government. Um, but I, I don't know about small bureaucratic efforts. Uh, although I will say, going back to your question about the opera, those are the kinds of things that I that the opera focuses on, is those single decisions by small people. You know, we're not talking Schindler's List. We're talking, I did something small, and maybe it jammed up the gears just a little bit. Um, uh, what was happening in the court of public opinion was their media. Yes, there was a lot of media. And, OK, and, um, and um, a lot of it was, um, a lot of it was, you know, you know, the main one, Der Sturmer, was very anti-Semitic, very supportive of the Nazi government. I've seen pictures of, you know, they used to put copies of Der Sturmer on the street corners so that everyone was getting exposed to that. They also rode through the streets with, um, with vehicles that had loudspeakers and they could read the news as they wanted people to hear it that way. There was a decree that banned Germans from listening to the BBC. Because of course, you know, Britain's not that far away, especially in Western Germany, um, and you, you weren't allowed to listen to international news. Um, so there was definitely this cutoff of of um, of news. But there was also up until the late late 1940, um, and maybe even into early 1941, there were a whole host of Jewish newspapers, like 15 of them or so, just in Berlin. 
um, that were trying to help people through this whole thing. That's another whole lecture. You know, there was Jewish winter relief. Um, there was even a orchestra that was um, supported by the Nazis in order to kind of turn Jews away from protesting what was happening to them. So, um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of um, media, but a lot of it propaganda. There's, there's a great exhibit at the Holocaust Museum in Washington in the basement on propaganda and the Nazis, and I highly recommend it if you're ever there. Gabe, you have a question? Yeah, hi, Professor Mansfield. Hi. Thank you so much for giving this really interesting talk. So my, my question is, uh, President Hindenburg, I think you mentioned that he was elected, but he wasn't a fan of democracy. Um, I mean, one, it's kind of weird to be elected and not be a fan of democracy. But two, what was he, what, what, you know, what sort of government was he trying to, was he trying to restore the monarchy? Was that like the conservative agenda at that time? You know, I'm not really sure what his personal views were on, on what should happen. So I, I don't really know that I have the capacity to answer the question. Um, but he, clearly he was willing to participate. And the reason he appointed Hitler as chancellor was that you know they they figured it was better to do a coalition government with the Nazis, even though they were far right of the nationalists, rather than form a coalition government with one of the one of the le left or center parties, like um, you know the Socialist Worker Party. So, um, I, I you know what was he thinking individually in terms of how he balanced his anti-government you know, sense with his role in the government, I don't really know. He was really quite decrepit by the time a lot of this um, went on. Um, he had been a, a, a war hero you know, long before, but I don't really know, like, you know why he didn't just say, I'm just not gonna participate in this. Um, okay, let me just quickly look through Oh, the activity code for the CLE, that seems like a good question to end with. I apologize I didn't get to everybody's questions, um, but do you, do you wanna, do you have the code or do we have a slide with the code? Okay, so we'll put up a, a slide with the code. And I just wanna thank you all for coming out on this snowy Holocaust <laughs> Remembrance Day. And um, thank you to those of you that attended online. We really appreciate you attending online. Thanks.